Okay then. So the first question was extremely easy. Find the real and the imaginary part. So number one, find the real and the imaginary part of this complex number. So some of you have done by taking one plus i whole square, whole power four, and so on. That is also a correct way of doing this sum. But the easy way is. Uh, just by writing this complex number in the polar form. So, what is the polar form of 1 plus i? It is root 2 cos pi by 4 plus i sin pi by 4. So, if I take the power, if I take the power 2022, So then root 2 to the power 2022 is so 2 to the power 1011 and by De Moivre's theorem this will become cos 2022 pi by 4 plus i sin 2022 pi by 4. So this is nothing but 2011. 2 to the power 1011 so this is cos of 1011 pi by 2 plus i sin 1011 pi by 2 if you use basic trigonometrical formulas so you will get this value as 0 and this value as minus 1 so that means what you are getting 0 plus minus 2 to the power 1011 times i so what is the real part so therefore the real part of this complex number is 0 and the imaginary part imaginary part is minus 2 to the power 1011 so this is the thing i hope most of you have done this correctly and some of you may have made a calculation mistake while doing this so this was a straightforward question even if you have done in a different manner like one plus i whole square by finding square power four etc then also you get the same answer in any case so any confusion with this question any doubts you may ask sir i have solved the question but uh, at the end i forgot to mention the real part and imaginary However, I have found this uh, figure minus 2 to the power uh, 101i. Okay. I know like some of you have left the answer up to this line. So that's fine. Okay, that's fine. But always try to write the real part and imaginary part if they, ha they have been asked in the question. Even if you have not written this, if you have done up to here, don't worry, you'll get full marks. Okay. Okay, sir. So even some of you have maybe written this as minus, you have converted in the power of fours, I guess fours and eight. That is also fine. There is no problem if you have written in the powers of eight or in powers of uh, four, that is also right, okay. One minute. So this is a very easy question to discuss with. Let's go to the next question then. So question number 2a, it has got three parts. Again, this was very easy, very easy. So there you can easily get actually six marks. Okay, so gamma one was this curve. 
gamma 1 t is 1 plus i t and t is running from 0 to 1 and gamma 2 t was the semicircle e to the power i pi t 0 lesser equals to t lesser equals to 1. You have to compute these three integrals one by one, each carrying two marks. So gamma one, one by z, dz. You want to compute this integral. Now, some of you have used Cauchy integral formula for this. Can you apply Cauchy integral formula for this? What is your uh, guess? Like, can you apply the Cauchy integral formula here or no? So I am asking you a simple question. You tell me whether you can apply the Cauchy integral formula here or not. No, sir, we cannot. Okay, somebody said no, sir. Can I hear the reason? Because there is a no closed loop. Be a bit loud. Because, sir, there is a no closed loop. Right, that's correct. Because this gamma one, this, this counter is not a closed counter. This is a straight line, okay? You can only use the Cauchy integral formula when you have a closed counter like this. But this is gamma 1. Gamma 1 is not closed. You cannot apply the Cauchy integral formula to compute this integral, okay? There is no question of applying it. So you know the formula. You can compute this integral f dz over some curve gamma. You have a direct formula for this. Some limits will be here. And then f of, you write down the parameterization of gamma and then derivative and then dt. And suppose t runs from a to b. So this formula, you know. So just apply that one. So the limits of t is 0 to 1. The function is 1 by z. So 1 by gamma it is 1 plus it. The parameterization is already given. The derivative of gamma t the derivative is nothing but i and then dt. So very obvious and this is a very simple integral now. You can take this i outside. What is the derivative of, what is the integration of 1 by 1 plus i t is log of 1 plus i t and divided by the derivative of 1 plus i t because you are somewhat applying a chain rule here. So 1 plus i t you have to take the derivative, you have to divide by the derivative and then you have to take the limits from limits of 0 to 1. So this is nothing but log 1 plus i minus log 1 and log 1 you know that you know that it is, it is 0. So the answer is log of 1 plus i and if you, you can you can leave your answer here or you can also simplify this by using the formula. So log of a complex number is modulus of this complex number, which is log root 2 plus i times argument of this complex number. Argument of this complex number is pi by 4. So you can also leave the answer here or you can also leave the answer here 1 by 2 log 2 plus i pi by 4. So you can leave your answer either in this step or in this step or in this step. But if you have applied a wrong integration formula here, you will not get any marks. If you forgot to write this division by i, then you will not fetch any marks for this question. So this was a very easy integral to solve. Any confusion, anything else to ask in this question? Okay. So keep that in mind. We are not supposed to use the Cauchy integral formula just because the contour gamma 1 is not closed. So forget about checking the analyticity or something else, but that is not closed. The second question, I'm doing the next page. On, achha, let's start here only. So the second question, number second part. So integral gamma 2 z bar dz. Now Again, you see, look at this curve gamma 2. 
gamma 2 is just a semi circle it is not a not even semi circle it is a semi circular arc because t runs from 0 to 1 if i put here t equals to 0 this is 0 and radius is 1 the argument is 0 and if i put t equals to 1 the argument is pi so this will go from here to here this is the semi this is the semi circular arc represented by gamma 2 this is not a complete circle this will be a complete circle if t would have been up to 2 but this is not a complete circle this is a semi circular arc going from here to here okay so keep that in mind again you cannot use the cauchy integral formula because the contour is not closed so this is not a complete circle so again apply the same this this thing you have to apply the same thing so which is the limit is 0 to 1 again then gamma so gamma is gamma 2 is nothing but so e to the power i pi t so the conjugate derivative of e to the power i pi t is e to the power i pi t times i pi right and then dt and what is the conjugate of this thing the conjugate of this thing is e to the power minus i pi t is very easy to see e to the power i pi t times i pi dt and this this two quantities will cancel each other and become one where e to the power 0 is 1 so i pi is a constant and integration will be t and the limit is 1 to 0 to 1 so it will be just one so this is your answer that you should get so very simple question for two marks So similarly, the third question. You have to just apply the definition of integral again here also. So here it is gamma one again, modulus z whole square dz, which is nothing but integral zero to one, one plus i t. So conjugate, and the derivative is i, and then dt. So 0 to 1 if i write down the conjugate so 1 minus it i'll write as line again 1 minus it whole square into i dt just apply the formula for a minus b whole square so a square plus b square so this will become minus t square and then minus 2 it multiplied with i dt i'll i'll take this i inside only so this will become 0 to 1 i minus i t square and then this will become plus 2 t dt you can do the integration very quickly so you can take i common from here 1 minus t square the integration of 1 minus t square is t minus t cube by 3 limit is from 0 to 1 plus integration of 2 t is t square limit is from 0 to 1 If you simplify this, you'll get one plus two by three. And this should be your answer. Any problem? Any confusion? Okay. Number three. Find the radius of convergence of this power series n greater than or equal to zero. This is n square plus log n plus one x to the power n. Now this is not a bracket. This what I have used here. This is not a bracket. This is the integral part of this number. and you know the meaning of integral part the greatest integer function so most of you have taken this as a bracket so so that is not correct by the way okay so here if i compare this with suppose suppose this is nothing but if this is a n x to the power n say then here a n is the integral part of this n square plus log of 
n plus 1. Okay, this is not just n square plus log of n plus 1, it is an integral part. So, the computation of limit is very easy here. We have, so you can also use a different technique here, but I have used this technique. So, the integral part of this thing. This is definitely greater or equals to n square because n square is a, a natural number. Okay, so you can just see that integral part will be definitely greater or equals to this and definitely lesser equals to this n square plus n. The reason is very clear since log of 1 plus x or 1 plus n is always lesser equals to n for all n. Okay. So this part is less than n. So the integral part will also be less than definitely. So I will take power 1 by n throughout. So 1 by n, this will become a n to the power 1 by n, this or equals to n into n plus 1 whole to the power 1 by n. So this is nothing but n to the power 1 by n whole square this is less than equals to a n to the power 1 by n and this is n to the power 1 by n into n plus 1 whole to the power 1 by n. You know that n to the power 1 by n always tends to 1. So as limit n tends to 1 by n and going to infinity is indeed 1. So this is also going the left hand side is also going to 1 and the right hand side is also going to 1. Okay. So therefore by the sandwich theorem or the squeeze theorem, the limit this limit is also one. So therefore, the value of the radius of convergence is exactly one. So this was easy, not that difficult. Some of you have also used a different technique to solve them, solve it. So if it, if it is correct, then it's fine. But this is the standard technique. Any problem? No. So it has also got one more part that so you have to check. Hello. Yes. Those who have not used this technique, then what about them? Marks if, if you have if your process is correct then you'll definitely get marks don't worry about that like this is not only the way to get get to this uh, limit one you have different techniques also if you can also use a n a n by a n plus one also to get the answer okay yeah so actually humne kya kya tha matlab log ko expand karne ke baad fir only upper bound se show kar diya tha that's why i was thinking Ha, huh, that is also fine. That is also fine. Okay. Huh, but if you have not taken the integral part into consideration, then which marks cutting your skill again? Okay. Okay, sir. And the second part was uh, check the discuss the convergence at a complex number z such that mod z is r here for a real number a. Achha. So you have to also discuss so discuss the convergence for z with mod z equals to 1 because r is 1 here so some of you have just checked the convergence at at only one but there are many complex numbers satisfying this property with modulus is 1 so if you are checking just at one then it is not enough. You have to check at every complex number z with this property. So let if modulus of z is 1, then z is of the form e to the power i theta. That means you have to check the convergence of this quantity. So n greater or equal to 0. This is a n is just a minute. e to the power i n theta right because 
x to the power n so this will become e to the power i to the power n so this is this is convergent or divergent this is divergent as what is the reason for this why it is why is this divergent because so this tending to infinity limit now does not goes to zero yes so you have to consider even this part also yes this actually goes to infinity or i'll just say this does not goes to zero as n tends to infinity. So even if you write this justification that is enough but checking only at one will not be sufficient if you just just taking take z equals to one and then you are just taking uh, only checking at one that is not enough you have to check at every complex number whose modulus is one okay we'll go to then question number four true or false what is the answer to question so the first question is every continuous function on the complex closed unit disk can be obtained as a uniform limit of polynomials so what is the correct answer true or false true the correct answer is false okay so can anybody justify why the correct answer is false anyone justification so the correct answer is actually false the reason is very simple so question kya bola that every continuous function on a complex closed unit disk can be obtained as a uniform limit of polynomials false so what is the justification every polynomial is every polynomial is holomorphic or even entire you can write every polynomial is holomorphic and uniform limit of holomorphic functions is holomorphic Let's explain what i'm writing so when you have a sequence of functions and each one being holomorphic and if this sequence converges uniformly to f then this this is one of the uniform limit so this uniform limit will again be holomorphic okay so this you can prove it so every polynomial is holomorphic that is a even they are entire by the way and uniform limit of holomorphic function is holomorphic so now do you get the answer or i should write more that means if i can choose a continuous function which is not holomorphic in the unit disk then you cannot obtain that function as a uniform limit of polynomials so uh, if fz or f is continuous but not holomorphic in the unit disk in the closed unit disk unit disk then we cannot obtain a 
as a uniform limit of polynomials. Am I clear or not clear? For instance, you can choose. So can you, can you give me one function which is continuous but not holomorphic? Yes. Z bar. Right. So if you can choose, if you take this function, then this is continuous but not holomorphic, and hence you cannot obtain uh, this function as a uniform limit of some polynomials. Is the justification clear or not clear? Yes, sir. Yes. So remember, every polynomial is holomorphic, and uniform limit of a holomorphic function is holomorphic. So you cannot do it. Okay. We'll go to the second question. Uh, the second question was: There exists an entire function f such that f z equals to z. For all z satisfying this and 2z if mod z is equal to. So, what is the answer to this question? True or false? False. Right. So, the answer is false. What is the justification? Because f is entire and identity theorem can be applied. Right. So you can construct a function g and you can do it using the identity theorem. So maybe I have to do it. You can take different g's, but I have taken this one. I hope this works. So let gz equals to fz minus z. Right. And for all z in b zero two, okay. So this implies g z is zero for all z with mod z equals to one, because then mod z is equal to one, then f z is z, so z minus z will become zero. And this has a limit point here, and hence by the identity theorem. So, so by the identity theorem or the uniqueness theorem, what can I say? That G Z is identically zero throughout this ball, and this implies F Z is Z. Okay, I can take here zero to three also. That will be fine. So I want to take this for all z in b zero three, which is a contradiction because look at the definition of f. It is not. This is not there. Okay. So hence, answer is false. Am I clear? Yes, sir. I'll very quickly go to number C then. What do you think? The question was: Let f be an entire function such that image of every unbounded set is unbounded. Then f is a polynomial. So true, sir. True. Sure, it is true. The correct answer is indeed true. So, I hope some of you have written this one. E to the power z as a counter example. E to e to the power z satisfies the hypothesis, so it is not a polynomial. Hence, it is not a polynomial. But e to the power z is not a correct answer because the question was image of every unbounded set is unbounded. But this is not the case in e to the power z. It's very easy. To see why, I'll just justify. Hold on.
हाँ इमेज ऑफ एवरी अनबाउंडेड सेट इज नॉट अनबाउंडेड इफ यू कंसिडर ए टू दी पावर जेड फॉर इंस्टेंस इफ यू टेक दिस वन जेड एन टेनिंग्स टू और और जेड एन इज माइनस एन इफ यू डिफाइन अ सीक्वेंस लाइक दिस दिस सेट बेसिकली माइनस एन सेट आई एम जस्ट जस्टिफाइंग वाई ई टू दी पावर जेड इज नॉट अ काउंटर एग्जाम्पल टू दिस इफ यू टेक दिस सेट माइनस एन सच दैट एन इज अ नेचुरल नंबर then what is the image so if this function is fz if this function is fz then if this set is a so what is f of a this is a bounded set not a bounded why so because if you take this limit as e to the power zn goes to 0 as n tends to infinity and what is zn zn is minus n you can see if you are taking e to the power minus n that goes to zero as n tends to infinity so this is a bounded set and not unbounded okay so this is the reason why e to the power z will not work okay so the correct answer is true justification You can actually see a theorem. I'll not prove it now. This partly comes from a theorem. That is, this is what f z tends to infinity as z tends to infinity. Or you can just use this also. The given implies f is a polynomial. You have to write a more proper justification for it. But for the time being, I'll just cite this. So the answer is true. I'll go to the fourth one. What about the fourth one? True or false? The question was, if f and g are two entire functions such that f g and f plus g are both constant functions, then f and g are both constant. True, sir. The correct answer is true. Okay. What justification have you all made? I want to just hear from your side first of all. I have made a justification, but I am not sure about it. And if it constant, then f minus three constant, and then solving f and three constant. Yes, even even this approach, I was thinking, like you are correct. Like basically, you are saying this f minus g whole square. F minus g whole square is f plus g whole square minus four f g, and this is the constant, right? So that will definitely imply that f minus g is a constant. Why is this a constant? Because f plus g is a constant, f g is constant. So that will imply that f minus g is constant, and and as we have f plus g is a constant, so f and g are constant. so i have basically this justification but i'm not using anything regarding the uh, entire entire thing given i'm not even like i don't know whether this justification is proper or not but i'm not using the entire thing okay like this even holds for any function what i feel but i have to check once again before claiming this is totally correct but i don't see a problem here do you see some problem here No, sir. So still, I'll check. But no, here I am not using the that f and g are entire and so on. I'm simply using that they are functions. But I don't know whether this has some problem or not. But I don't till now. I have not. I'm not able to determine what is the problem here if this is correct. Okay. Sir, maybe. Sir, Sorry. Maybe we are using f minus g. Sir, 
we, we are getting f square is constant then f is constant we are using that oh, so, that is also fine that is also fine yeah i have so seen some that, other that is that is true when cr equations that's why yeah yes. we have used that that can also be a correct procedure you are just assuming that that you are applying the cr equation to f plus g and fg and from that we are getting f and g are constant that is also a correct one but i was this is a very simple just yeah, actually matlab f or g function and that that's why matlab wo particular point pe apan is tarah se define matlab g f minus g defined hai nahi wo apan ko pata nahi that's why this is the weak weak no. justification if f minus g will be defined because f and g अच्छा तो एक हिसाब से बोल सकते हैं दिस जस्टिफिकेशन आल्सो होल्ड्स बिकॉज़ एफ और जी दोनों False. Is it false? Sure. That u x be twice continuously differentiable real function on C such that it satisfies the Laplace equation. Then there exists an entire function f such that u x is the real part of f. What do you think? Others true or false? So u is the real part of f. U x yeah is me. No, the correct answer is true. I'll justify. The correct answer is not false. The correct answer is true. The justification is simple enough. So, since uh, what was given, u x x plus u y y is zero throughout C. Therefore. there exists an entire function why entire because i am taking a c so entire function f or there exists an entire function g such that g is of the form u plus iv for some v uh in again so okay i'll simply write here v on you understand what is v here so then g prime is also entire you know that an entire function is differentiable infinitely many times and its derivative is also entire is also entire and what is g prime G prime is u x plus i v x. So take f is equals to g prime. Then f is entire with real part of f as u x. So this is the thing. So without justification, there is any mark. <laughs> okay, I'll I'll see about it. But you have to actually properly justify because that was of two marks. So justifications are not lengthy to give. They are very easy. Okay. Yeah, sir. But at that time, come up. I click me one to that. Ah. Okay, that's fine. I'll just see. And five. So I will not discuss five now because I was not able to see this question, but. I hope I can just give it a try. Where the question went? Just a minute. Or else I'll five discuss five in the next class. I have to go somewhere. Okay, I'll just see. Uh, it was like this. F Z is. Z by e to the power Z minus one for all Z satisfying this. So what should be the so so first question was 
so that this function can be defined at z equals to zero in such a way that it becomes holomorphic at z equals to zero. So what will you what will you take f of zero to be? One. One. So actually, because it is holomorphic, so it is also continuous at that point. If it is continuous, if it is holomorphic at zero, it should be continuous at zero. And to be continuous at zero, this is the condition. And if you determine this limit, this is how much this limit is one. So we define the function. The function should be defined at this way, so that. But you have to still check the check whether it is holomorphic or not now at one. This will be the thing, but we have to again justify why this is holomorphic at every point that you have to justify. And for the second part, I haven't tried yet, so I'll not discuss it today. Okay, so I'll, I'll end the class here now. If you have any doubts, you may just ask, or we can meet in the next class then. I'm just. Stop the recording.